So in this lecture, we will discuss Facebook's photo storage. Uh, the title of the paper is A Needle in a Haystack. So a haystack is a large storage. A haystack is essentially a stack of hay and a needle is a very small needle which is very hard to find if it is inside a haystack. So in this case, uh, the haystack is the photo storage and the needle is a single photo which needless to say is very hard to find. So we will uh, discuss an overview of the approach and uh, then the design and the evaluation. So this paper is uh, around 10 years old, it's slightly dated. Uh, so as of 2010 also Facebook was very big. It had uh, 260 billion images, which was very, very large for that time, even for now as well. Users would upload a billion photos a week, which would roughly be the order of 60 terabytes. And uh, the haystack system, which was a new and uh, improved approach. Uh, in this approach, uh, uh, this was uh, replacing the traditional approach, which was use the network file system, NFS. This reduced uh, the number of disk accesses. Because uh, an approach, uh, the main problem with a traditional file system like NFS was the increased number of disk accesses. So this is something uh, that the aim was to explicitly reduce. And also the, all the aim was to minimize per photo metadata because uh, we would keep some data uh, for the photo as well as some metadata to essentially identify. So the main thing it would contain is the size and the status of the photo. And of course, something like its starting position on the disk. So the starting position, the size and uh, the status will come to what the status is later in the lecture. Uh, these three things, the size, the status and the starting position of a photo uh, these are essentially things uh, that need to be minimized and also we need to serve a million images per second uh, which was Facebook's peak uh, serving rate those days. So that's the reason they had to create a novel custom bespoke solution, uh, a photo object store, essentially a store uh, only for photos. So this was known as haystack and haystack of course is in the line of things that we have been uh, in a sense studying over now. So we have looked at a few projects that essentially use the same elements. So we have looked at percolator, Google percolator which is built on big table. So essentially there is a distributed file system and there is a DHT some form of it. We have also seen Coda which is a distributed file system and then we have discussed Dynamo which is again a one hop DHT and uh, then we discussed Cassandra uh, which was for the inbox search problem. So of course in the inbox search we are looking at small messages right not large photos. So if a viewer were to ask why we can't use Cassandra to store photos well, Cassandra is not meant for that. Cassandra, the main uh, aim of Facebook Cassandra was to store small messages, not large photographs, right? That was not the aim. In this case, it is. So Facebook saves each photo in four formats. So the formats are large, medium, small and thumbnail. Uh, so these four, uh, so, so essentially every photo that we create, it is stored in these four formats. And let's say we apply, you know, some sort of a transition to a photo, like we rotate it, then essentially we create a new photo. Right? So similar to our previous assumptions, we assume the data is immutable. Immutable means that it does not change 
and uh, so which means that we write once and we read many times and if i were to create a new version of it like rotate it so essentially that is like uploading a new photo which is the same pattern it is written once never modified and also it's rarely deleted in the sense that we very rarely delete uh, photos from facebook uh, you know unless a photo has been uploaded in error we typically do not delete photos so any posix file system what is a posix file system well the linux and windows file system so linux ext 3 ext4 So the Linux and Windows file systems, uh, these file systems are POSIX compliant file systems. So they have a lot of overheads. It's okay for a general file system, but it is not uh, the best solution for a specific, uh, for you know, for, for something for storing a specific kind of data, specific type of data. So uh, what adds to the overhead? Well, we have directories that adds to the overhead in the sense that uh, the file system support a very hierarchical system so, so that adds kind of adds to the overhead uh, the further uh, thing is that uh, we store a lot of additional data like permissions and so on which are not required Right, so for storing photos, we don't require directories, we don't require permissions. There are problems with uh, traditional NFS uh, distributed version of a POSIX file system. In a sense, we need several accesses to read a file, not, not one, several. So given the file, we have to retrieve the inode number by traversing the directory tree, then read the data. Even if we do caching, it does not help a lot in reducing disk accesses. So the requirements that we have for a photo object store, the requirements are high throughput and low latency, right? It's not high throughput and high latency as was the case in other uh, approaches, which was like a more of a batch processing, right? So in that case, uh, you need high throughput and high latency, right? Uh, when you typically do not not care how long it takes, uh, but uh, this is not the aim here, right? Uh, the aim here is a very high throughput and a low latency. And uh, so basically for that, uh, we have to essentially create a very tiered system uh, that would allow this. So first we define a certain processing capacity, which means a certain quality of service for a server, uh, which essentially talks about the number of maximum number of requests that can be served per cycle. So if you're exceeding this, we can ignore messages. Not a good idea. Or what we can do is we can have Facebook system. And we can have something like Corona or Akamai, a content distribution network. So what the CDN does is the CDN is a set of third party servers, which essentially buffers Facebook data some of the popular data and it serves that to the users all right so in this case uh, what the cdn actually does is that it acts like a cache for facebook it takes popular data and it serves it to the users and uh, so the cdn is a third party offering and uh, so in this case whatever is popular can be served but the main problem and you would also see this in the paper that if i were to plot kind of the popularity on the y-axis and order the facebook pages on the x-axis the graph would be something like this so let's say the you will have a set of very popular facebook pages mainly for celebrities politicians 
but for most people most normal users and mind you this will be a massive tail you really have a long long heavy tail of just regular normal users so their photographs will not be extremely popular as a result the caching strategy of the cdn will not really help so it will essentially help for the celebrity part but for the regular normal users we need to use the default facebook system all right so this is the two layered architecture or this is the two layered structure of facebook and the cdn where the cdn is third party as i said like corona or akamai which serves the more popular pages facebook pages of course but we need facebook's indigenous haystack system for the rest of the re requests and they have to be served with a high throughput and a low latency we have some additional requirements as well that we uh, only want one disk operation per read not many not more than one and also another recurrent pattern that we have been seeing is that all the metadata of a file uh, that needs to be stored in main memory right such that the metadata at least can be accessed very quickly so the metadata gets stored in the main memory cache and the rest on disk but there also we are allowed a single access fault tolerance well uh, this is also a recurrent pattern that we have seen we saw that in amazon dynamo where the replication was across data centers uh, so this is required because if one data center fails we would like another data center to take over furthermore even within a data center we would like to have replication across racks such so that if one set of racks fail another set of racks can take over so with all of these modifications haystack registers a 4x throughput improvement over baseline nfs and the cost per terabyte the cost per terabyte of data serving a terabyte of data is 28% less which is substantial for a server farm so now uh, we need to understand where these numbers come from and what exactly did facebook do to get such a large improvement in throughput and also simultaneously at a lower cost so this is the typical flow of a uh, kind of a simplified simplistic uh, facebook system Uh, so in this case the web browser actually requests the web server for a photo or for a set of photos on a page the web server replies but it does not reply with the photo it replies with a kind of a internal facebook url the internal facebook url is sent to the cdn which acts as a cache for the photo storage it acts for a cache for haystack if the cdn has the data it returns it otherwise uh it forwards the request to the photo storage which then retrieves the photo from uh the haystack storage and returns it via the cdn some of the popular photos may be cached by the cdn for later users so let us now look at the default approach that uses a distributed file system nfs so as we have discussed using cdns content distribution networks is not an effective solution the primary reason being that requests have a very long tail the popularity distribution has a very long tail and the cdn caches only the most popular photos so most requests are anyway sent back to the backing photo store which in this case is haystack furthermore what nfs would do is that it would save each photo as a file on a commercial nas appliance so nas appliance is a network storage appliance where the storage device is connected on the network and is accessible over the net so uh, what we are essentially doing is that uh, in this case uh, given a url it is being mapped to some sort of a storage vo uh, volume and the data is coming from the path of the file 
of course we can uh, do a default implementation where we save hundreds of files per directory to kind of minimize the depth of the directory tree this would require three disk accesses read uh, the directory metadata right uh, so this is the first access load the i nodes of the file and read the file contents so the optimization is that we can cache file handles so caching file handles uh, does not really help because of the heavy tail nature right so this is not very helpful uh, and the reason is that for this range which is very very long caching does not work uh, there are a few competing technologies like mysql well this is mysql is meant for relational data it's a relational database the data that we are looking at here is not of a relational character hence it's not useful we have looked at the combination of gfs and big table in google percolator so in gfs we divide a file into chunks we replicate the chunks and store them on different servers uh, but in this case, we are dealing at the granularity of photos. So this is not a very scalable approach. Plus, GFS tries to give us kind of a general file system, which is not what we want. And big table is again built on top of GFS that takes a large multidimensional table, splits it into small chunks, replicates those chunks. Again, uh, this is not the best solution for us because our data is not a multidimensional table and we have already looked at the shortcomings of traditional nfs on nas storage devices so what we actually want to do is that we want to create a new kind of a file organization that uses elements that we have seen in the past so we will have we will store all the metadata of the file which includes the, its position on the disk and its size and its status flags so this in some sort of a easily searchable form an index in ram and then the actual file will be stored the actual photograph will be stored on disk so of course we would like the ram to disk ratio to be as high as possible in the sense more the ram the better it is of course there are substantial cost implications with a larger ram particularly in a very large data center so the aim here is to find the right mix, the right balance, such that we can minimize the cost for creating the data center, as well as uh, kind of uh, maximize the RAM to disk ratio, right, at the same time. And as we have been discussing several times, the problem for serving user Facebook pages cannot be outsourced to CDNs. So for uh, the Facebook pages of celebrities, yes, but not for regular users uh, because of the heavy tailed pattern. So the architecture of Haystack has three components, a store, a directory and a cache. Uh, so we will discuss them in turn. So the store is the actual photo store that stores all the photographs. So what we do is that the entire photo store, which is of course a distributed store, is grouped into logical volumes. Think of this as a large directory, right? A large distributed that is a logical volume, right? So this can be thought of as a large distributed directory. Each logical volume uh, will be stored on several servers. Uh, so, they, so then each replica will be called a physical volume, right? So each logical volume, uh, let me call it an LV, will be stored on multiple servers, right? On each of them, each replica will be called a physical volume. And needless to say, on a single server will never have two replicas of the same logical volume because the aims of redundancy are not really being served. We then have a haystack directory which actually does the overall control uh, which you know, exercises the overall control in this process 
So what the haystack directory does is it, that it does a logical to physical mapping in the sense given the logical volume ID, it create, gives you the physical volume ID which essentially includes the ID of the machine that stores the physical volume howsoever it is specified. Either IP address is the easiest. Second, uh, given the photograph, it maps it to the logical volume. So what it essentially does is given an identifier for the photograph, it maps it to the logical volume and further maps it to the physical volume. Right? And physical from the physical volume, we find the machine that stores it. And what the machine actually gets is a tuple of the photograph and the logical volume because the machine might be storing multiple physical volumes right one corresponding to each different logical volume so this tuple is actually given to the machine such that it can find the photograph from within it and what is the cache well the cache is a dht a regular dht that we have seen in the past right something like pastry cord dynamo etc so it's a regular DHT, which is an internal CDN of sorts, uh, which can cache data and give it to you. But of course, it is not a small in-machine cache. It is a large distributed cache. And uh, the large distributed cache is organized as a DHT. So let us now take the previous figure that we have shown and add some details into it, some extra details, some additional details into it. So one of the detail uh, is uh, details is like this, uh, that given uh, our web browser, so essentially we open a Facebook page on a web browser. The web browser sends the request to the web server the web server then sends the request to the haystack directory. So what does the request have? Well, the request has either, you know, the identifier of one photo or multiple photos. Then what the haystack directory actually does is that the haystack directory, then uh, the first decision that it takes is whether it should direct the uh, user directly to the CDN or to the or directly to the haystack cache in the sense one connection of this nature exists where the user can be directly directed to the haystack cache by bypassing the CDN and second given a photo it does the mapping photo to logical volume to physical volume to physically where the machine is so, so this of course is not done uh, by the haystack cache. So the haystack cache would only do this much of mapping and what it would essentially re return to the, sorry, this would be done with the haystack directory. This is uh, something what it would return to uh, the user. Well, also this would also be there. So these three things will get returned to the user. So user means the user's browser and the user browser user's browser can then send it to the CDN. If the CDN has the uh, photo, then it will of course send it back. Otherwise, the CDN will send the request to the haystack cache. The haystack cache, as you can see from the structure, it is organized as a like a DHT. And then if the haystack cache has the photo, well, well and good, that's great. Uh, then the photo will be sent back to the uh, the photo will be sent to the his, uh, back to the user. Or uh, if it does not have it, it will send it to the haystack store. The haystack store will then search for the photo within uh, the physical machine. And once it gets the photo, uh, it will return the photo uh, to the haystack cache. And the haystack cache will, of course, store it over here. So this at least takes care of some temporal needs. Then, of course, we have an option. It depends on what the directory has originally con configured the request to be. So the first option is that it can be sent directly back to the user, directly back to the browser. And the other option is that it can be sent to the CDN for further caching, which is what we show in this figure. And after caching it, the CDN can return the result to the browser 
so this is completely a function of exactly how the request has been uh, configured by the haystack directory where it actually goes first so this is like you can think of the request response cycle as having two distinct phases so the first phase is where we talk to the directory get a get an expanded url for the photo right and then uh, we uh, uh, make a fresh request uh, via the cdn by the CDN cache and store. So the web servers use the directory to create a URL for each photo. So this, so this, so that is the job of the web server. And uh, so then the URL that they create uh, will be of this type. It will be HTTP because HTTP protocol is being used. So the first uh, entry will contain an entry to the CDN. Uh, so it will be the IP address uh, of the CDN and uh, so it will point the user uh, to the CDN and, th and then uh, the user's browser can retrieve the photo from the CDN. Uh, so what is being sent? Well, the logical volume and photo is being sent such that the CDN gets the first chance. However, if the CDN does not have it, then automatically it is sent to the cache. The CDN sends it to the haystack cache. If the cache has the logical volume photo tuple, it will return that to the user. Uh, if, the, if again the cache does not have it, it, the, it is sent to the physical volume, which is a physical machine within the haystack store. The physical machine will have it for sure. So it will again take a look at the logical volume photo. So logical volume, of course, within the physical uh, machine is stored as a physical volume and then it will look up the physical volume find the photo and return so the upload process is kind of analogous where the user contacts the web server the web server contacts the haystack directory so in this case the directory's job is so since it's a new photo it's a fresh photo the directory's job is to assign a writable logical volume and uh, so the writable logical volume so these logical volumes are fresh any logical volume can be assigned so in this case the directory assigns a writable logical volume the web server on its part uh, then sends a request to the haystack store the store will write the new photo to all the physical volumes that uh, store a replica of the logical volume so let us now discuss uh, the functionality of the haystack directory. So as we have discussed before, it provides a mapping from a logical volume to a physical volume. So this is like deciding which replica we need to send, uh, we need to send the request to. So note that in this case, since uh, this is read-only data, it's immutable data, we don't really need a quorum. So we don't really need to read from a quorum of replicas. There is no version management, right? So version management and so on that we had in Amazon, all of this is not there, right? We just can send it to any one replica and read. And every single uh, photo is protected by a checksum. So there are internal mechanisms of finding out if bits or bytes have been corrupted or not. So one of the things that the haystack directory does is that it uh, does a load balancing of the writes across the logical volumes which means that across all the logical volumes that are there uh, so, so, so let's say that uh, a write needs to be done so of course a write can be sent to any logical volume because it's a fresh photo so since the write can be sent to any logical volume, so we need to choose that logical volume where there will be some load balancing. There is not a lot of traffic in any one volume. So it will do a load balancing. Also, it makes a determination if the request will be handled by the haystack cache or the CDN. If it's a popular page, it can be handled by the, haystack, by the CDN else it is directly sent to the haystack cache or it might be sent to the haystack cache via the CDN. Also, 
it marks volumes as read only once they fill up so every logical volume has a capacity so this is the maximum size of the logical volume so once the logical volume fills up the entire logical volume is kind of sealed and it is marked as read only this means that the logical volume will further not expand so what we need to do is we need to start more machines and create new logical volumes because as i said every logical volume has a maximum size so uh, so this means that uh, to create more of these writable volumes to write new photographs we need to start more machines this means that the data center facebook's data center has to continuously expand has to grow because what was found out was that roughly 20 to 25% of the photographs are deleted so in general we do not delete photographs from a facebook profile unless they have of course been uploaded in error so since the photographs uh have to be deleted I, i'm sorry do not have to be deleted uh facebook's storage capacity keeps on increasing that's the reason we have a cap on the size of a logical volume and once we reach the cap it is marked read only and we initiate uh, we, we bring in more machines into our system the haystack cache well it's very simple it is organized as a regular dht the key is the photos id and the value is the photos data of course if an item is not there it is sent to the store so here there are some interesting uh, two interesting schemes that we should talk about uh, so the haystack cache right can get a request either from the cdn or from the user's browser directly depending upon the way that the haystack directory has configured the request so if it is coming from the cdn then it uh, caches a photo uh, if it is actually coming from the user not from the cdn the reason is that the cdn itself is a cache so there is no reason why it should also cache the photo because if cdn does not have a photo it will anyway get it from the store and then the cdn will cache it so there is no reason for us to cache it twice but if the user is directly requesting the haystack cache then it will cache the photo the second is that it does not cache photos for read only logical volumes the reason is uh, that a volume becomes read only after a certain time so this can be roughly let's say after 100 to 200 days uh you know once photos are not used anymore uh we sort of configure the system such that the logical volume fills up and it becomes read only and at that point uh, what the engineers of facebook actually saw is that we do not need uh to have quick access to these photos because users very rarely look at photos that are more than you know 3 months or 6 months old right? you know very rarely you'll take a look at them so they are still a part of your facebook profile but uh, they are not uh, accessed access that frequently that's the reason there is no point in caching those photos hence when a volume becomes read only we do not cache its photos only for write enabled volumes that are in a sense holding more recent data write recent photos we cache them in the haystack cache let us now come to the haystack store which is the third component of our discussion so each store machine will manage multiple physical volumes where each physical volume actually corresponds to a different logical volume so this is uh, here is one of the key innovations of the facebook engineers that they designed a physical volume to be a single very large file not multiple files otherwise we would have had to do a directory access and get the details of that it's a single file and it's a very large file so in the large file 
of course as a large file is organized as a stack all right so pretty much what we do is that uh, we have the data for one photo over here the data for the next photo so on and so forth so essentially we just concatenate the photos the data for the photos on the large file and it is organized as a stack so it is never the case that we delete a photo there is a hole over here we try to put in something that's not done so we essentially have immutable data data that does not change and uh, like a regular stack we just keep on adding photos this way in this into this very large file so for accessing a photo on a machine what we actually need is the logical volume id because that is how it will map it to the physical volume which is this huge large file the offset of the file which is the starting index of the uh, index of the byte within this large file and the size of the photo which tells us how large is the photo such that we only read this part from this large file so this becomes the photo so uh, as you can see the data organization is very simple we have a large file where these photos are concatenated one after the other the only thing that we need to store is first the id of the file which comes from the logical volume id the offset which is the starting position and the size of the photo which is the end position within this file furthermore the store machine uh, the machine that stores uh, these volumes keeps a mapping in memory in memory mapping of photo ids to the metadata and metadata is this data so from every photo id to this metadata there is a mapping which is stored in memory right quickly accessible stored in memory uh, so this is similar uh, in this similar pattern that we have been seeing where we keep the mapping in memory and the actual data some of it in memory most of it on the disk now let's come to the file structure so as we have discussed the physical uh, volume is a huge large file which is growing like a stack so first it starts with something called the super block which kind of identifies has all the meta information regarding this and a sequence of needles where a needle is essentially one photo right it's a sequence of needles so each needle has the following fields it has a header so of course header uh, identifies the name of the photo type and so on then it has an important field known as the cookie so the cookie is a random number uh, the aim of the cookie is essentially to defeat a certain kind of attack so imagine i have my facebook profile and in that if let's say my photos are kind of named you know uh, www.facebook.com/srsarangi/1.jpg/2.jpg/3.jpg it will become very easy to guess the ids of photos i can start doing bulk downloads and i can even if there is little bit of laxity in security i can guess the urls of photos of other users i can download them you want to defeat that so a cookie is a, a large number uh, so so it's a 32 to 64 bit number uh, so this is a random number which is associated with each photo so to get access to a photo we kind of need to know its url and also supply this random cookie which you can think of it like a password for the photo and only if the cookie matches the photo is sent back so this makes it hard to guess right this makes it hard to guess photo urls right because you know for every photo that we get the cookie has to be supplied and we will not know the cookie right unless we are a legitimate valid user and the photo is also being accessed in a legitimate and valid manner the browser will not have the cookie for a photo every photo internally is identified uh, with 
a key and an alternate key. So the sum of the key and the alternate key is 96 bits. So that identifies a given photo. Then we have the flags field. So the flags field is very interesting. So we have till now maintained that a photo is not deleted, right? So if a photo is not deleted, then uh, so that's the reason we have an ever growing list in one direction. But in practice, we can delete photos from Facebook, even though it is rare. But nevertheless, we can delete photos, we can delete entire albums from Facebook. This is possible to do. So in this case, we should have some mechanism to delete. And the mechanism is very simple. We keep a single bit, the delete bit. If this is set to 1, it means it's deleted. If the delete bit is set to 0, it means it's fine. So what we do is we keep a single status bit, a single status field within a flag and this is within the flags field of the needle and to delete a photo, well, it's as simple as just saying that we have set a bit to 1, which means that the next time the haystack system actually sees the flags, it will see the delete bit and it will automatically conclude that the needle has been deleted. Then the regular uh, fields, we have the size field, number of bytes, the data, the data of the photo, the actual data of the photo and a checksum to just verify that if a single bit or a single byte has been corrupted or a few bytes have been corrupted, it allows us error detection and recovery. So the mapping between the photo ID, right, the ID of a photo and the needles fields, the offset, the size, etc. is kept in memory. So the memory we have a mapping, we have an index from the photo ID to the corresponding needle. And uh, so the aim of the cookie was mentioned, the cookie field was mentioned. That is hard to guess the URL of a photo. So now let us come to the write and delete operations. So for the write operation, we provide the logical volume ID, which of course we get from the from the haystack directory, the key and the alternate key, the cookie, which is a random number, and the data, the data of the photo. Once we have all of this, we go for the write. Each machine, each physical machine updates its in-memory metadata index, it creates a needle and it writes the data, right? So each machine independently that stores the associated physical volume uh, updates its in-memory metadata index, creates the needle, writes the data. And since a photo is never modified, if we remove red eyes, rotate the image, a new image is created and is saved with the same key and alternate key, right? So with the same uh, pair of keys, we save it. But it's just that in the metadata, in the metadata which is stored in memory, sorry, in the metadata that is stored in memory, previously we were pointing to one needle. We just change the mapping to the new needle. Photo delete, well, we have discussed this in the past that we set a single bit in the volume file and the in-memory data structure to indicate that the file, the specific needle, the photo associated with the needle has been deleted. So let us now discuss the structure of the index file. So the index file is used to create the in-memory data structure. So while doing a reboot of a machine, the index file is created. So it is essentially a checkpoint. So it is either created or it is read. So it works like a checkpoint of the in-memory data structure. So the in-memory data structure, what we do is we read the index file, we map it into memory and that becomes the in-memory index. 
this has a similar organization we have a super block and again a set of needles where in this case a needle is essentially a pointer to the needle in the data file right again a set of needles okay so all of these are needles so the index file and the data file are kind of updated asynchronously so it's not like we take a lock or a semaphore or something and update both in tandem so the both of them might not be in sync all the time so the application is aware of that so of course the data file is primary and the index file is kind of secondary so that is kept in mind so one thing that we do is after a reboot the store machine first runs a job to bring the index file in sync with the data file after that for a long time you know it does remain in sync gradually asynchronous uh, some amount of asynchronicity keeps up but then again when the load kind of reduces they're again brought in sync so we can say that the lag between the index file and the data file is kind of variable but definitely either periodically or after a reboot we ensure that we read the data file and ensure that all the entries that are not there in the index are brought in one advantage is that since the data file is uploaded is updated sequentially it's like a stack right it's updated in the sequence and the index file is also updated in a sequence so we can pretty much say that there is a one to one mapping between the data file and the index file updates so the index file updates that we couldn't actually do in a given time frame if we just queue them then they will also be in the same order so what we need to do is we need to apply them to the index file in the same order and finding out how many outstanding updates are uh, remaining that's actually very easy you just need to check the size of the queue and or we just keep a count so let's say if the data file is in 200 updates and index file is seen 190 then we know that the 10 most recent updates to the data file are not there in the index file that is subject to the fact that we apply the updates in order and given that the data structure is also inherently sequential this can easily be done to simplify the entire process so the file system the underlying file system well store machine should use a file system that allows them to perform a quick random seek on a large file so note that these are not sequential accesses these are random accesses random seeks so the store machine uses a variant of it's a, it's a little known unix file system called the extent file system so in the extent file system uh, it's a normal file system what happens is that we allocate at the level allocate space at the level of disk blocks and a disk block could be 512 bytes could be half a kb 1 kb 2 kb not more than that but in the case of xfs we typically all allocate uh, chunks blocks uh, where uh, uh, in, I mean essentially in, in a much larger chunk right in a much larger chunk and so maybe at the level of 1 GB and create a block map for it a block map is the index corresponding to the chunk that has been allocated so what we do is maybe we allocate a 1 GB chunk and then we cre create a small block map for it which again can be cached in main memory so this means that if we have all the indexes over here and then we let's say run out of space on the data file we give it a new extent and a new extent let's say is in 1 gb extent we create a small block map for it which again extends the index and this small block map kind of stores pointers to all the needles in the newly allocated storage so this also allows us for efficient pre-allocation of files if you are kind of aware of their sizes before the data comes also what we can also do is that we if we have an approximate idea of the size of a photo let's say that they're 100 kb you know more or less then we can kind of uh, allocate 120 kb uh, needles over here such that uh, there'll be some amount of internal fragmentation, but then we can quickly reserve space for them and quickly insert them at the relevant needles. 
so these things can be done they are kind of optimizations to the baseline uh, facebook photo storage file system so they have not been discussed in very great detail uh, in the paper recovery from failures so a background task called pitchfork runs uh, this periodically checks the health of each store machine so how does it do that it attempts to read data from the store machine uh, if it finds a problem or thinks that the disk is not accessible problem in the disk problem in the network it maps the machine as read only which means that new writes are not sent to the machine right and then we try to fix the problem and the and if the machine is an if right and if the machine is otherwise fine which means that it is possible to fix the problem either via rebooting or by doing some kind of a configuration change if we can fix the machine then we start a bulk sync operation from another replica to synchronize both the data as well as the index files some optimizations over here which are due compaction uh, we reclaim the space of deleted uh, needles or duplicate needles how do we do that well uh, so the only way is we don't create holes in an existing file we take the old volume file and we dynamically move all the valid entries to a new uh, volume file so let's say few of these entries are invalid doesn't matter so this entry goes here this goes here this goes here right so we dynamically kind of compact it so over a year roughly 25 percent of photos get deleted uh, so this is the amount of compaction that we can do along with that photos get modified because we make changes to them like rotating them removing red eyes applies applying filters and so on one more thing that we can do is that we can for a deleted photo instead of setting the flag bit to zero we can send its offset to zero which is like a special code being given which tells us that look a photo has been deleted so on an average for each photo so mind you we have four photos one photo actually produces four photos a large a medium a small and a thumbnail for each of them we spend roughly 10 bytes so we have a total of 40 bytes of main memory 40 bytes of metadata main memory uh, that we save per photos and also we try to sequentialize the writes because traditional storage devices such as com commodity hard disks group photos into albums and so we thus try to sequentialize the writes as much as possible increases the performance at the server side so if i were to plot the cumulative percentage of accesses the y axis with the age of the photo which is a graph that we have been referring to and this is also the kind of locality behavior the shape of the curve is something like a times 1 minus e to the power minus bx kind of a general uh, curve of this type so a curve of this type is something which kind of has an asymptote a strictly defined asymptote and so what we see is 90 percent of the cumulative accesses right all the accesses are less than 600 days old so roughly within one and a half years we access 90 percent of the accesses fall within that which means we definitely do not access old photos and if you see the chart in the paper you will find that within three months or so almost all photos are accessed otherwise their access probability reduces to very very low levels right so given that some statistics uh, so of course data publication is 2010 so in 2010 120 million photos were uploaded per day uh, so this means and 1.44 billion uh, haystack photos were written so how does this come so 120 billion this is which is 0.12 billion into 12 so how does 12 come the factor of 12 so this is equal to 1.44 the factor of 12 comes from two numbers so first is that there are three replicas 
of each logical volume. So we write it thrice. And 4 is because every photo is stored in 4 separate sizes. Uh, large, medium, small and thumbnail. So that's the reason even if 120 million photos were uploaded per day, 1.44 billion haystack photos were written. And roughly during this time period, 100 million photos were viewed. The view stats, 85%, most of them are view stats for small photos. 10% are thumbnails. So these are the ones that you see on a typical Facebook wall. And the large photos, which are ones that we kind of expand and see, are only 5% of the views. right? And so, so that kind of gives us a, some kind of a statistical estimate of how the photo store uh, is internally optimized to deal with them. Read and write operations, well the read and write operations are the majority of operations are reads in a Facebook like system. So one is that we are actively accessing a photo, the other is that let's say you know, if I just visit my friend's profile, I get to see hundreds of photos even though I actually don't want to see them, right? The, face is, uh, the, the Facebook page is kind of full of photos. I see photos of friends, many things he has been doing, photos of friends, friends all of that, but I'm not really interested in all of them, but nevertheless, I see them. The writes in comparison, uh, so uploads are far fewer, and I, uh, as you have seen, an upload is also a more expensive operation because we need to give it a logical volume and then multiple writes have to be done to the physical volume. And given every photo, we have to generate four versions of it. So all of that uh, requires effort, right, requires time and but thankfully writes are not as frequent as reads and there are almost no deletes in the sense deletes are few and infrequent, we can deal with them. Uh, one of the interesting observations is that reads are much slower than writes. Uh, so the one of the reasons is that of course writes are kind of off the critical path. We can quickly write something to a cache and come back and gradually the write will kind of percolate deeper into the system. In comparison, reads are on the critical path. So we directly need to go to the machine and we need to do the read. Right? Writes in many cases can be cached in memory. All right, so you can write to memory and say that, look, later on the data from memory will get persisted to disk. But in read, we'll have to actually have to go and perform the disk read to actually get the data and the read times were kind of high 10 milliseconds but the write times are small 1.5 milliseconds. So this paper was published in OSDI in 2010 and of course after that Facebook itself has grown significantly uh, right so, so Facebook is no more the Facebook of 2010. So in 2010 I still remember that a lot of people were still not uh, using Facebook to that extent and uh, so so they, uh, I, I mean Facebook was kind of, uh, uh, Facebook was kind of coming up those days but nowadays of course Facebook is ubiquitous so everybody has a Facebook page and a lot of major updates are being sent on Facebook page. Academic institutions have their Facebook pages. Everybody has them. Celebrities have them. Politicians have them. Policies are discussed on Facebook. So in fact, if you're not on Facebook, uh, it appears that, uh, you know, you don't exist. So this was not there 10 years ago. So those 10 years ago itself, we're looking at, uh, you know, so many photos, billion plus updates. So nowadays in the current regime, things are of course an order of magnitude more, but many of these things are not documented. So we'll have to wait for Facebook to publish more papers such that we get an idea how they handle today's scale and what modifications they have had to do to actually handle data and traffic in today's scale. 